All right, now I want to introduce a, a different subject. Uh, Santiago uh, uh, Panetta uh, is from Bogota, Colombia. Went to uh, LSU for his uh, fine arts degree. And uh, he's going to be talking to us about the appearance of our scale models. And from my standpoint, our scale models as art. And I, I talked to uh, Santiago a little bit about this. And, and Santiago, thanks so much for doing this tonight. I really do appreciate it. Happy to be here, Jim. Thank you for the invite. And it's a pleasure and a privilege to speak to your audience today. Um, this in some ways is a kind of response to the article that you put out on the newspaper, I think somewhere around October last year. And uh, it has to do with the conversation of scale modeling as art. <clears throat> that conversation, while extremely interesting, is a very problematic conversation, if you ask me. In the sense that um, people seem to be speaking about it from very different points of views. Um, the ideas that are thrown around seem more like opinions rather than arguments. And while fascinating, we don't seem to find any common ground about what we're thinking about here. And um, yeah, I thought that, I've always thought that the places where these conversations are held nowadays, forums and social media, are not particularly conducive to these kinds of, this kind of uh, deep, interesting, nuanced conversations. I mean, who wants to read a never ending thread about uh, the relationship between art and modeling where people inevitably are, going to, inevitably are going to say something rather arrogant or something utterly ignorant. And um, people seem to speak on top of each other and uh, not much progress is made. And when I saw your column, uh, your very passionate column, I thought it was very interesting. And I thought perhaps this kind of video format would be better suited for in any way, in any way contributing to the, to the, to the topic and um, laying out these ideas in a more interesting way. So here I am. The title of my talk is Unshrinkable, the Appreciation of Scale Models. I'd like to start by saying that I love my models as much as the next guy. I, I really appreciate them. They're a, a fundamental part of my life and I'm happy to have found this sort of passion. But at the same time, there's an aspect of our model making which is more theoretical than empirical. And um, I'm perfectly aware that for a lot of people, the hobby is something of a source it's a source of, um, of, of joy and um, enjoyment and fun and may not be so interested in the theoretical aspects and the conceptual aspects behind scale modeling. And so in, I'm in no way intending to push those ideas on anyone. But I think that um, a little bit more arguments rather than opinions would be very useful for our community to, to make progress in a conversation that is um, very difficult and very problematic, if you ask me. And so the appreciation of scale models, here we go. I'd like to explore three notions, essentially, and three notions that are somewhat related to the idea of scale modeling and art, but at the same time, I want to speak outside of that conversation. I'd like to point uh, people in a different direction. And the three notions that I'd like to explore are the following. If scale models are not art, what are they? And, and without, in a dispassionate way of looking at them, um, what are we talking about when we talk about scale, model, scale models outside of the, the, the art world and perhaps looking at them from the, from the side of um, science and engineering, which, are, which is a particularly fascinating topic. Um, the second notion that I'd like to explore is the idea of the self-propelling miniature, which um, is a very particular characteristic of our models and set them apart, for instance, from static modeling. And so our scale models, particularly model railroading models, are very particular in that sense. They speak to... Uh, a kind of production, which, a kind of production which you, which you don't see 
in, for instance, military modeling and even um, ship and airplane modeling, even though those are also self-propelling, but the constraints are different. We'll talk about that um, in, our in our next installment. And finally, I'd like to give a, a bit of an overview of the problem of scale models, not only historically, but um, technically. We, ten we tend to think of our models very much from our passion and our hearts. There's a technical aspect of scale models that has to do more with the sciences, physics, mathematics, and engineering. Um, so something uh, like that, I think, um, may be interesting and useful for our community, our community's further understanding of uh, scale models. But let me start um, with a very generic experience that I think we've all had, we've all had, and I think we can relate um, in many, many ways. You invite someone uh, over, someone that is not interested in, in model railroading, uh, perhaps friends, perhaps uh, family members, close relatives. You talk to them about your trains and you show them your collection of fine crafted um, brass steam engines and passenger cars. And um, they're all interested right away. Everyone seems to recognize um, these artifacts as special. No one dismisses them quite easily. Uh, they are immediately attracted to them, even though they're not interested in starting a hobby like we are, which is an interesting idea in and of itself that we cannot dismiss these objects or as not important from the get-go. Um, but you're showing, them, you're showing them your collection, perhaps you're running a small train or a long train or whatever it is. You're not being very specific because you don't wanna overwhelm them with things like the governor part of a steam engine or a brake system in a particular freight car. But you show them your collection and everyone seems extremely interesting, extremely interested, I'm sorry. You tell them about the nuances of, of the production, um, the production um, processes in today's uh, market. You tell them about the finesse in the models, uh, the sophistication, the resolution, how beautifully crafted they are. And they're all, all responsive. They all look at them and say, yeah, they're really wonderful. And at some point in the conversation, someone will say, they're definitely, definitely works of art. And um, if you're feeling adventurous, you push the conversation a little further and you say something like, well, thank you, I really think they're beautiful. What kind of art would you say they are if they are in effect art? And then um, after giving them a second look, someone will of course say the following, they're wonderful works of sculpture. And at that point, I sort of dropped the conversation because I know immediately that what we're talking about and our understanding of the scale model or scale models in general is fundamentally different. So we're coming from very different perspectives. And perhaps if I get to do anything tonight is um, I'd like to dismantle the idea that scale models have anything to do with art. Um, I found this interesting comic strip that I thought was very illustrative of the situation that I just um, talked about. Uh, this guy is showing his layout to his um, friends, perhaps neighbors, who knows? And he says, I wanted to show you guys the latest addition to my train layout. I just finished it. It's a perfect replica of, this, of, of the Centerville post office in the 1930s. And his interested friend says, amazing. Look at the detail. You can even see little people inside. And then the guy on the right on, with the red jacket and the red cap um, says something which I think we all can relate to some, to some degree. He says, I'll bet you wasted a lot of time on that, George. This situation is precisely what I was just talking about. We are looking at something from a completely different point of view. The guy on the right thinks a waste of time. The guy on the left is probably doing something that he loves. And um, there's a fundamental difference there. Look, if you ask me at the end of the day, scale models are more related to painting than to sculpture. That is an argument that perhaps requires not only more time, but a much more of a scholarly approach for it to be developed. But um, it seems to be a kind of a trope or a general misunderstanding that because a depiction is three-dimensional, thus, it is sculptural. And if a depiction is two-dimensional, thus it is painting or pictorial. The problem with that is that 
nothing in the art history discourse says anything like that. The problem of sculpture is not necessarily the depiction of a figure in three dimensions. It can look like that, but the fundamental problem of sculpture, like I'm going to argue in a second, is completely different. And the idea, for instance, about dimensionality, which comes up um, a lot in our hobby, has more to do with painting than with sculpture. But again, that kind of argument requires more time for it to be developed. And if you ask me, again, when we look at our beautiful scale models, we are not looking at a sculpture. We're looking more of a something like a three-dimensional projection of something that either was or is in the world. And if we're talking about a projection, we're talking about a depiction that has to do more with geometry and dimensionality. And again, those are all ideas that are more related to painting than to sculpture. But let's look at the idea of how scale models have almost nothing to do with sculptures. I brought to your attention, I'm gonna to bring to your attention two sculptures from great masters in the art history discourse. One is Andrea del Verrocchio, of early Renaissance sculpture, great genius, and one that is more closer in time to our time frame, which is Richard Serra, a great American sculptor. But let's look at this one first. We're looking at a um, bronze cast sculpture by Andrea del Verrocchio. And uh, this is a great, great early masterpiece that I thought was very instructive um, when it comes to telling people about the fundamental problem of sculpture. Pewdo with Dolphin is a sculpture that was supposed, was placed initially in the center um, of a fountain gracing the entrance of a Medici villa, the 1470, close to 1470 um, early masterpiece by Andrea del Verrocchio. Now speaking about misconceptions, a lot of people say, um, you ask them about Andrea del Verrocchio and they'll say, well, Leonardo's teacher. It's a trope that a lot of people, even people interested in the art world or um, art students will say this. And that's a fundamental misconception because Andrea del Verrocchio is not only a masterpiece, but perhaps along with Donatello, the greatest sculpture um, from the entire Renaissance. If, if it wasn't for Andrea del Verrocchio and Donatello, we wouldn't have someone like Michelangelo, for instance, which everyone seems to think it's the greatest um, Renaissance sculpture that there was. But the true contributions, the fundamental contributions of sculpture in the early Renaissance and throughout the Renaissance come from either Donatello or Andrea del Verrocchio. Bronze casting, for instance, which is the technique that we're seeing here, was revived by these two sculptures in the early Renaissance and uh, revived from, the, from classical antiquity. But let's look at the sculpture a little bit more closely. Because the sculpture was supposed to be placed in the center of a fountain, Andrea del Verrocchio revived an idea from classical antiquity in which a sculpture didn't have a fixed composition, meaning that you wouldn't have to look at it from a particular point of view for you to appreciate the piece. So Andrea del Verrocchio revisited the idea of a sculpture who had either multiple compositions or no composition at all. What do I mean by this? If you look at the sculpture and you go around it, you appreciate the figure as you walk around it, you realize that something very magical happens. And this is that the composition resolves itself as you walk around the sculpture, meaning every point of view is as satisfying as the previous one. That is a remarkable achievement. It's a great, great masterpiece. The, the, the original is now uh, housed in the Palazzo Vecchio in, in Florence as a national treasure. And it's a reminder of the, 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 the great genius of Andrea del Verrocchio. Here what we see is an object that provides the possibility of a high order aesthetical experience that is embedded in space time. That I think speaks more about the fundamental problem of sculpture. A sculpture is not depicting in three dimensions. Sculpture has to do more with space and time and the possibility of an interesting aesthetical experience. Um, considering those two dimensions of, of, of being in the world, so to speak. Um, so again, if, I, if I'd like to reinforce the, any idea about this culture is that <clears throat> the appreciation of it is temporal and it's spatial. And you're experiencing it and you're seeing it as you move around it, the possibility of a aesthetical experience of a highest order becomes um, possible. 
If you look, for instance, at sound practices in contemporary art, the people that do art with sound, those are always understood to be spatial and they're also understood to be sculptural. So that's one example. Let's look at the second one. I'm not gonna talk about specifically about this work because it's so convoluted with um, even legal aspects, but I think it was, I thought it was also instructive to bring home the notion of the fundamental problem of sculpture. The great um, American sculptor Richard Serra is famous for making this sort of minimalist, massive, raw, masculine, um, large scale sculptures. And we're looking at one that was placed in, um, in front of a, bird, uh, of a government building in Manhattan in, in 1981. It looks completely different than the one that I just told, that I just showed you because we're looking at um, many hundred years apart, um, productions many hundred years apart. But the, pro the fundamental problem of sculpture remains. This piece in particular, in particular, and the pieces of the long steel self-standing paints, uh, steel paints by Richard Serra are very, very special. What do I mean by this? When you look at a sculpture by Richard Serra, the sculpture is not the steel paint. That just sounds a little mind boggling. Like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Yeah, that's the sculpture. The problem is if you actually study Richard Serra in depth, and you look at what he's trying to do, even in some interviews, he'll say this, the sculpture is not the piece itself. What he's interested in is in having the still pain self-standing sculpture produce the, um, produce the possibility or allow the possibility of an interesting spatial and sculptural experience. So in other um, examples of self-standing steel paints, the idea is that the steel pane provides the possibility of an interesting space that you can experience. And that space in, in the final analysis becomes the sculpture. So again, when you're looking at a Richard Serra sculpture, the sculpture is not the steel pane. It's the interesting space that it creates around it. And of course, that allows for a possibility of, of an interesting aesthetical experience to emerge. And of course, those experiences are like in the previous one, time and space related. You have to experience the space, you have to walk through the space, you have to feel the space in a different way. And um, that allows for an interesting sculptural experience to, to happen. In this case, for instance, in the square one, it's so divisive, the piece is so divisive, it's placed in a square where people are supposed to greet each other, to recognize each other as citizens, to share space, to, to say hello to each other. And the fact that the piece is so abruptly placed um, is in a way telling you about the nature of the space that it's in. It's a square. We're supposed to recognize that space is different. So again, the problem of sculpture has nothing to do with depicting something in three dimensions. And if you go back to the problem of scale models, I can't imagine a, sculpt a great sculptor thinking, I'm going to build the most amazing sculpture that I can imagine. I'm going to scale something down and then, gonna, and then I'm going to add every single detail that I can imagine. It doesn't work like that. And uh, I think that the, the comment of looking at uh, all the details in our wonderful craft, wonderfully crafted scale models, that is a problem that has to do more with resolution. Scale and resolution are slightly different. Um, but again, the idea of resolution is not, as, uh, it's not an idea that you can translate to sculpture that easily because uh, sculptors are not thinking about making a sculpture with a lot of details. And if it has more details, thus it's a better sculpture. So again, um, I think we're better off calling our, our beloved miniatures and, and scale models with a different name. A sculpture is something else. And um, those kinds of easily, easily access um, misconceptions well, they're not hurtful, but they don't help. They're not hurtful, but they don't help us either. So um, that's perhaps the first idea that I wanted to convey. I'm going to make a few points here now, and I'll, I'll finish with, with uh, one more slide that I think is going to help us meet each other at um, halfway, so to speak. Instead of calling our scale models sculptures, I think we're better off calling them miniatures. In our case, that's certainly true. Our model, uh, railroad models are certainly miniatures, 
And um, in that sense, we are related to a tradition that is very much ancestral. Miniatures, we tend to think about them like, well, maybe toys and things like that. But uh, miniatures are actually quite consequential if you, if you think about it. Miniatures are, for instance, um, part of collections in museums everywhere. They were perhaps among the very first depictions that human beings came up with. And in that sense, miniatures are, have implications in very deep problems like uh, the origin of language, the origin of expression, uh, the origin of um, art, um, the origin of, um, or implication when it comes to phenomenology. Um, so again, the greater problem of representation. When we're talking about miniatures and our scale models are miniatures, we're talking about a depiction that is embedded within the greater problem of representation. Uh, that's a problem that again is fundamental, like I was just uh, like I was just talking about, and um, perhaps I'll I'll explain that idea later on. I was going to um, make a relationship between how representation may not be particular uh, a problem that is particularly interesting in the art world today. Um, it's very fashionable to hear, for instance, talking uh, people talking about how certain artists go beyond the problem of representation. That's an idea that. Um, it's perhaps more contemporary than anything, but um, but um, the problem of representation is not a solved problem, and it's a fundamental problem that our depictions are related to. If we are embedded in the problem of representation, you could ask yourself, well, what is the uh, type of representation that we're talking about? And uh, we're talking about our scale models. We should be talking about a kind of iconic representation in the sense that our models resemble that which is that which is being depicted, and then if you want to add a figure of speech to our models, you would have to talk about uh, something like a simile, not so much metaphors and other things because um, those would be a little bit more problematic. Simile meaning that it looks like that which is being depicted. This one is very important, I think, because it speaks about the fundamental characteristics of our model trains, and that's the fact that our trains not only resemble the thing, but they have an intent to simulate that which the thing is depicting. So in that sense, we have something that is a simulation, but our um, miniatures, our scale models also are capable of moving by themselves. So scale models, particularly model railroading models, um, scale uh, railroading models are simulations and automata. Those two characteristics are very, very interesting because they're very particular to this type, this, type of, this type of production. And automata, the problem of automata is a very deep historical, philosophical uh, problem that um, everyone recognizes as, as important. If you look at the history of scale models, and again, I'm trying to tie it with something different than the art world, our the modes of production of uh, our scale models have more to do with the problem of applied and decorative arts, not so much with the world of fine arts. Fine arts has to do more with personal expression and the ultimate way of self-expression. And in a way, the history of the art world has been a kind of detachment from the, conventional's way, the conventional way of production and understanding of the mediums. If you look at um, late 19th century painting, for instance, um, artists tried to detach themselves from academia and from the conventional ways of doing. And the world of applied arts and decorative arts are much more related to what we uh, acquire when we acquire um, a brass or um, scale model crafted somewhere in the Orient. So something to keep in mind. There, we're talking about two different worlds in a way. Uh, two more points. Miniatures and scale models. Um, they are related, but they're not particularly, they're not exactly the same. Miniatures are not as constrained as scale models. I mean, if you make a little figure of your dog and you're not feeling particularly um, interested in depicting it in, in every fine detail and you make something, or a kid makes a, a, a Play-Doh model of a dog, you're looking at a miniature. It's not a scale model because not everything in that depiction is scalable, meaning it doesn't translate uh, in scale. Or it's not uh, the mustache is not related to the tail and things like that. Scale models 
in our case are miniatures, but scale models are not necessarily miniatures. If you make a scale model, for instance, of a human eye for medical and educational purposes and you scale it up, that is a scale model, but it's not a miniature. So there's all kinds of interesting nuances, nuances when it comes to our understanding of miniatures and scale models. They overlap, of course they do, but we're not talking about exactly the same thing. And I'll talk about the problem of scale models much more technically in our third installment, but I'd like to show you just one picture before we close uh, of something that I'll talk about next week. I'd like to meet you halfway, like I said before, and finding some common ground between when a miniature approaches the notion of art and um, how that may be interesting or problematic in that sense. We're, we're, we're gonna be looking at two examples of two um, artists or um, craftsmen, a, craft, a craftswoman called uh, Narcissa Thorne. And uh, I'll start with this next week, but um, there's are examples where the, the idea of the scale miniature, of the scale model and miniatures themselves seem to approach the level of art where we seem to put them um, in a place of self-expression and notoriety where we can see them in some, some of the finest museums um, in the world. So I'll talk about next week, next installment. Thank you for listening. Santiago, thank you so much for doing this. I, I learned a lot tonight. I, I, I never thought about uh, the, uh, the sculpture in the way that you, uh, you presented it. Thank you so very much. My pleasure, Jim. Sorry if I took too long. No problem. See you next week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.